Right, um, Wave Story from Cypher. Starting just to get the mood right with a video which uh, Harry Singh, which some of you may remember, uh, took. He was always taking videos, and we were actually soaring in an easterly wave straight overhead the airfield. If you look at it carefully, you'll see uh, down through the clouds the occasional slot of Cypher and certainly Junction 14. So I'll let it speak for itself. Right, um, you'll, you'll see that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Do a key bit for that. What, what you might have seen from that is obviously uh, we were soaring in a gap in the clouds, in the wave slot, uh, at unfortunately 5,450 feet above sea level, um, 5,500 being illegal. And um, for quite a lot of that flight, we had the, the brakes open, uh, otherwise we'd have climbed up on top. The, uh, the nice thing is, it's serene, it's quiet, it's beautiful, it's not that frenetic chasing around in thermals. Um, if you've not been wave flying, you need to try it. If you have been, you know about it. It's certainly the best way of flying. Well, it is for me anyway. Right, um, what we're going to cover is something about the basics. Or how to forecast it, something about local conditions, you know, where, where you're likely to get it in our area, um, how to get into it, how to get the best out of it, including travelling around a bit, and then how to get back safely. All happy with that? If there's anything else, uh, let our host know and uh, I'll add it in at the end. Right, um, you've probably seen this before. I'm not going to dwell a lot on it, but uh, it's an approximation to the way the air moves through a wave system. Um, a note of warning that the, the, the up bits are much steeper than they are in real life. In fact, the, the displacement's more like one in 10 rather than one in two or three. Um, and you can see basically it's triggered by the hill, the bottom, the air flowing down there overshoots a bit, it's got inertia, rebounds, and that happens almost any time the, the, the air blows over a hill. Can you all see that pointer? Yeah. Clearly, okay, good. 
But for it to be useful to us, we need this condition here, unstable air in the lower atmosphere and then stable air above it. The reason you need the unstable bit is if, if it's not unstable or if it is stable, the air won't follow the contour because it's resistant to changing height and you won't get this initial wave. On the other hand, if it's not stable above, this vertical movement won't be passed up through the layers of air. So you might get a low single bounce, but you won't get the uh, draft going further along. The other thing is you need that to get the second and third and fourth bounces, which are very important to us at Seiford because if in a westerly, we're about 40 or 50 miles away from the hills. So we want the wave system to extend all the way to our site. <coughs> we also need the wind speed to increase with height. Reason for that is as you get higher, the air is less dense and the wavelength would actually tend to reduce so that the waves further up would be shorter wavelength. On the other hand, if the wind is faster, that will tend to increase the wavelength. And if the conditions are right, the two will cancel each other out and the wavelength will remain roughly the same up here as it is down there. If it's not the same, after two or three bounces, the two are going to get out of phase and the upper waves will depress the lower waves and the whole system will collapse. All right, so if we're looking for a wave forecast, we're looking for this unstable, uh, stable air above it, reasonable wind strength, but importantly, getting greater with height. All happy with that? Yeah. That's all we need to know about that. I mean, there's a lot more detail that you could go into, but uh, as far as local soaring, these are the conditions. This is a satellite picture. Uh, it's over the sea, which makes it clearer because the sea comes out dark. And you see an island here, obviously with hill, six up above the sea, and there are the waves bars extending downwind. Now, if that was Wales, or the Welsh hills, Seiford would be about here. Right? So if we've got six or seven waves, it will be still happening. And in, clearly in this photograph, this wave system here is working. This one isn't working as well. And that's because almost certainly the, the waves off this island are interfering with the waves off that island. So again, you can't be certain just because there's a hill that it will generate waves. It depends what's going on. Um, quite often, um, at Camp Hill, for instance, they get wave off the hill in front, which interferes with the ridge lift. And it basically kills the wave or the wave kills the ridge. But either way, you end up without lift. The other thing you can see in this picture is the waves here appear to be at an angle to the wind. We often think that the waves will always be at right angles but to the airflow. They're not. They're at right angle. Uh, sorry, they're parallel to the ridges that are causing them. So don't assume that if you come up to a wave bar that the wind is going to be blowing straight towards it. Right, let's move on. If you look at this as a normal 215 forecast, this type we download quite often. It's the only one I've seen in the last week where there's a wave forecast. And what you're looking for is MTW, mountain wave, 500 feet per minute at 9,000 feet. Yep. Unfortunately, it's up here, D, in Norway, where they get a lot of wave, but it's not a lot of use to us. Okay. If you see that, what you also have to take a note, if it's affecting our area, is the, width, the cloud heights and how much cloud there is. So it's saying isolated or scattered broken Q and static Q, 3,000, 4,000 feet. Okay. That's very important because obviously we, we need to know where cloud base is going to be, particularly if we're above it coming down. Um, 
I've had one or two incidents uh, with that I'll mention later. The other thing we need to know is um, about where the freezing level is. The wind forecast, this is the 214 form, is equally useful in forecasting wave. On this side, you've got the increasing height, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 feet, then the wind direction. It is very important that the wind direction doesn't vary that much throughout the wave system. 20 degrees is okay, it will still work. 45 degrees and it's not going to work because the waves up above will interfere with the waves down below. The reason we're not getting a wave forecast for this area is quite obvious. The wind speed actually isn't increasing at all up to 10,000 feet and it's not increasing much above that. So clearly this wouldn't be a good wave forecast. Okay, but if you see something like 10, 15, 20, 40, and so on, then there's much more chance of there being a useful wave. You can also look at things like RASP. Uh, RASP has got a wave forecast. It's not particularly good for the flat site forecast. Obviously, we're looking at slightly different conditions. So if you go to Lueni or the Black Mountains or Millfield or Port Moak, um, all of those give you very, very different sorts of wave in terms of the strength. And very often the wave they will get there will only be the fir that first cycle. It, it may not work downwind, but that's you know, the benefit of being next to the hill. Right, and move on. So, where are we going to get our wave from? We need a hill to generate it. Um, it's fairly obviously there's a lot of hills over here. Unfortunately, we can't use them for recreational purposes as Wales has taken a different COVID route. And then we've got a flat area leading to the airfield, which is about there. The flatness of the Shropshire Plain, Staff North Staffordshire, is quite useful. If there were hills, small hills in the way, that would tend to create other way of things, which may or may not be synchronized with the waves from Wales. But if it's flat, they're likely to extend that way. And obviously we're looking here at winds basically westerly through to northwest. We've also got the high ground of the Peak District, so in a northeasterly there's likely to be wave, but it doesn't work quite that way for one or two reasons. And if we look a little more closely, so now we've got Stafford Stoke, got the high ground here but there aren't any really marked down gradients that create the wave that we've seen in the past. But this line I've drawn in is the Trent Valley. Although it's not very much there's a nice edge along the Trent Valley. It's only two or three hundred feet but behind it in the northeasterly is a slightly higher bit of ground here which tends to work with it. So in a northeasterly, you may, may well get a wave there and the second wave pretty well overhead the airfield. Occasionally, Canuck Chase works. Again, the slope there isn't very great, but the, you can get wave in this area. All right, so the main, but certainly for the high flights, we're looking at wave from the west, northwest but we also get some wave in the northeast. One of the downsides of things in this area is like that video that we started with, um, we're limited by the airspace. So five, five, that's it. Okay, whereas we've only got to go out to about here and we can go to eight and a half and then over here up to 13 and a half thousand feet. So the big stuff comes in this way, but we have to work that way to use it. This low thing, remember that this, this unstable air needs to be about the same sort of height as the hills. And as I mentioned, these hills are not very high. In fact, the tops are about five, 600 feet above sea level. So in the early morning, or more likely evening, you get wave off here because the stability, the instability is about the right height. 
Later in the day, when it becomes much more unstable higher up, you're less likely to get wave off there. And we can see the effect of that when we start looking at a couple of flights. So we're not, like most flat sites, we're not ideally placed in the classic way. But just to put things in context, if we go back to the original slide, um, they've done lots of wave flying, well not lots, but certainly some wave flying from Dunstable into Wales. And that's using waves off the Cotswolds and yeah, obviously in fairly high performance gliders like um, the, the Ash 25, uh, one three used to do quite a few trips that way. And they've even had wave over in East Anglia. So don't assume because you, not because you're in Lueni Park, which is about there, that you can't get wave. You can. Right. And to prove the point, there's a few pages there uh, chosen from the logbook, a few flights from the logbook. Is Simon online? Yes. Um, yes, that was a good flight. Yeah. Just I remember that one. We moved to Cyford. Uh, one evening we had a group to fly. We'd flown everybody. There was a K13 sitting there. Nobody wanted it, so can't remember who was in the front. Well, that, but Simon and I uh, lobbed off the winch in an easterly. Um, didn't st sink much. Wandered over to Norton Bridge and sat there in wave, 1300 feet ish, for 50 minutes. As we'd taken off at eight o'clock, the thing that drove us back was the fact that the street lights were quite bright. <laughs> Otherwise, I think we could stay up there all night. Just, just a question, Peter. John Richardson would like to know, does anything come off the Reekin in a southwesterly? No. Um, if we go back, the problem with the Reekin is it's pointing that way. and Therefore, it's very unlikely to develop any... There isn't a, a, a long slope across wind. And the same goes for Wenlock Edge. So we don't get any significant wave in southwesterlies. Right, um, a little later that year, both of these flights were thermal then wave. Um, in both cases, the wind was around about 300 degrees. And in both cases, the wave was found at Chetwind which is what about seven nautical miles upwind of the airfield in that direction. Um, I found if you're looking for places to go in that, that wind direction, 300, check winds a place to go. Right? And if you tow there, you're usually about the right transition level by the time you get there. Right? But I'll, I'll mention more about that later. Um, I think, oh, that, that was an interesting one. Um, 1st of January, 2006, I was on duty. I got there dutifully at about half past eight. Nobody else did, because they were all sleeping it off, weren't they? So I pulled the uh, Romeo Delta, the old SF-25 out of the hangar and sat over Stafford with the engine off at 5,000 feet for about, well, 45 minutes it says, uh, waiting for, to look for cars arriving at the airfield. Um, it was going quite well. I think that was pretty well in northerly as well, unusual direction. So yes, we get them. Uh, this is only a sample, probably had about five or six wave flights a year. Um, I didn't get many from uh, after 95 to 2004 because I was doing much more flying at Slope during that period. Did quite a lot over there, but that doesn't count. Um, again, another one over Stafford. So the limit was the airspace with Tony Knight. Uh, some of you may know Tony, was an instructor for many years. And again, we were sat over stuff with the spoilers out. This was a guy who turned up for a trial flight. He was a flyby pilot. His first flight, we romped up a, a cloud street pretty well to jet wind and back. The second flight, we romped up there and then transitioned into the wave. Um, he thinks gliding is always like that, <laughs> probably, which of course it might be. Right, um, that was the first flight up to about 8,000 feet. What you probably notice is it doesn't look at all like wave flights. That's quite typical. Uh, you've got 
muddle of cumulus clouds. And when you're in the middle of this lot, you can't really see the wave structure. It, it's, it's quite difficult to spot. When you get a little bit higher, it becomes much more obvious. You've got a wave gap here. And remember, the gaps are the things to look for. What's missing, although there's some sign of it here, is what no, many people think of the sign of wave as the classic lenticular cloud. It's very rare that it's either an indication of good wave or the absence of lenticular doesn't mean the wave's not there. It simply means there's nothing going on very high up. Okay, so that's a little higher. This is the later flight, which went higher. Again, very little indication. You can just about make out there's a movement of air like that and over there and then down again. But the slots at the start of this flight were very narrow. A lot of cloud around. And a little bit higher, then you can see the gap. Right. If you were over it, you'd be able to see the ground but uh, move a little bit further away and you can't. That itself is a problem when it comes to navigation, unless you're using GPS. Uh, I don't know if Paul Witters is with us tonight, but that's his old airfield, Turnhill, from about 8,000 feet. And you can see the cloud sheet ends here, right? The wind is blowing roughly that way and the clouds are reforming there. So this is a very wide wave slot at this point. The nice thing about it, when you're at that height, there's no rush to do anything. There's no, where's the next thermal coming from? It's just serene and beautiful. I put this one in, it was actually the flight um, in the old motor glider. Um, again, the slot here is very wide, but there's an absence of cumulus in it. And the way wind is blowing from left through to right. Where it's rising, it's forming the cumulus along this line. So where, where the aircraft is, is about the right sort of place to pick up some rising air. In the distance, there are some clouds that are leaning over at the top. And I'll mention a bit more about that later on. That's a really interesting and useful sign. And again, on the same flight, the air's flowing across the gap and rising here, causing the cumulus to form. But again, not what you might think as a classic wave sky, but it is, it works. Right, how are we gonna get there? Erato, it's by far the best, easiest way. Um, as long as you know where you want to go, <laughs> or perhaps more important, the tug pilot knows where you want to go. Um, about, oh, probably about 10 years ago, the only aircraft that had to hand was a K-8. And I thought, mm, it's, it's going to be working at the Chetwind. So the briefing to the old tug pilot was, go to Chetwind and just carry on climbing till you get there. It was blowing about 15 knots on the ground. So we went off and on, on the way out, we flew through sink and then lift, then into sink. And as we hit the second loss of sink, the tow pilot turned through 90 degrees, stayed in the sink, and I sort of released at that point, tried to push through, but it was a waste of time. At the subsequent debrief, about 20 minutes later, why did you turn? You were getting too far away, he said. And I thought 3,000 feet, 10 miles up wind was in a 15, 20 knot wind was all right. So do make sure your tug pilot knows what you want to do. Um, if you're towing out, um, certainly if I'm towing in the label, I'm getting about seven, six or seven knots average anyway. Um, so if I don't see 10 knots, that means I'm not, there's not three knots benefit from the sky. So if I, if, I don't, if I don't see that 10 knots, it means when I release, I won't be able to soar. Right? A lot of people, if they see just a one knot improvement, think, oh, we're in it. Well, you're probably in weak lift, but it's not enough to keep the aircraft going. So don't release too soon. An extra couple of hundred feet makes all the difference. So, a couple of questions. 
A couple of questions, Peter. Dave Shepherd would like to know, is there a collated list of conditions and good locations to look for? Um, well, I've said Chetwind in a northeasterly is a good place to go. Um, and the other conditions are just that, you know, increase the wind speed with height, unstable air down below, stable air on top. One condition that brings that is approaching warm front. If you've got a warm front coming in, it automatically means there's some unstable air in the cold layer underneath, and then stable air sliding up above. However, and it's a big however, that also brings a lowering cloud. So you do have to be careful. Um, I once went up with that and had a best part of a 9,000 foot cloud descent. I stayed up too long. <laughs> Enough of that. <laughs> right. Chris Fox would also like to know, I wonder which tuggy that might have been. <laughs> I wouldn't want to say who, but he, he was famous for dropping people in it in every sense of the word. Right, um, thermaling into it, it's easier than you imagine. Uh, obviously, it's not an option for winter. You, you've got to have thermals to go. But it used to be thought that waves and thermals didn't mix. Well, in one sense, they don't. Um, but conditions that give you wave are also likely to give you thermals because of the low inst instability down below. The trick is to move from one to the other. You've got the unstable, turbulent air at the thermal, and at some point there's a transition. And I'll show you a little bit more about that later on. But the techniques there are simple. Uh, very often, in if there's wave on top, the thermals will organize themselves into streets. And you simply get, get under one of those streets, thermal your way up, until either by reaching it or by seeing the gap on, in the cloud shadows on the ground, you come to a gap with a big cloud just on the downwind side. And if you make a climb in that cloud and then push into wind, it's surprising how often that turns into wave. But I'll, I'll show a little bit more of that later. Um, you are very unlikely to get a winch launch into, cloud, um, into wave, apart from the, in the evening, that sort of low level wave. And then it will only work if it happens to be where the winch is placed. So, um, you know, as, it, as a general way of getting into wave, don't think about doing it on the winch, unless it's a good thermic day and you think you can thermal in. Um, most glider had quite a few good wandering around looking for wave. Uh, you can explore, you can think, oh, I'm better to the north, that sort of thing. But it's also very frustrating because a typical motor glider is sinking at maybe 350, 400 feet a minute compared to a glider, less than half of that. And uh, so you can get into wave, you know you're in air that you could soar in a glider, but the motor glider won't soar unless you keep the engine running. So it's, it's okay. And the good trick is to let somebody else find it first. Um, so if you do find wave, tell people, report it, and all you need to say is where you are fairly precisely, what height you are, and what climb rate you've got. You just call it, you know, cipher gliders, overhead jet wind, 4,000 feet, climbing two knots. And hopefully half the fleet would then head to jet wind. At that point, of course, the, the wave then collapses and you get blamed, but uh, that's all right. Uh, of course, that only works if it's the receivers are listening. Um, but it's always useful if there's a chance of wave to listen to the radio, not on the site frequency, but on one of the general gliding frequencies. We ought to agree that at the briefing, what we're going to use. Okay, so main method, Aerato. Um, and in summer, thermaling into it the best way, or letting other people find it with the motor glider first. When you find it, you've got to find the best lift. And this diagram makes it clear, you've got the peak there where the air is just transitioning from going up to coming back down. The best lift is a quarter of a wavelength forward. Is that? Okay, almost irrespective of anything else, that's where the lift will be. And on a blue day, without cloud, you're just going to have to fly around and find out where that is. 
Okay, blue waves, interesting things. Um, you've really got to have a half an eye on the vario and where you are and a lot of thinking about it. If there's any cloud, especially if there's not much cloud, the clouds will always be associated around the peak of the waves. So you need to be a quarter of the way forward from the top of this cloud to the one upwind. Not necessarily on the edge of the cloud. If, it, if, if the cloud cover is only about a tenth of the sky, then you're going to have to be well forward of the cloud to find the best lift. This is the mummy bear situation. The daddy bear situation is rather different. Now we've got a very wet day, narrow gaps, perhaps even no gaps. Now the best lift is still a quarter of the way forward from the top to the bottom. And the only way we're going to get there is to either air a tow along with a very switched on tug pilot who will fly through the top and drop you here, or you're going to climb through the cloud there where the lift is. It's often not that difficult because it, it, it's very often quite a thin bit of cloud and you can very often see the sun all the time you're in it. But obviously you do need to pro be proficient in cloud flying and have the glider, you know, the right instruments to do that. Cloud flying endorsement. Okay, but remember the lift, it, once you're in the system, the lift is going to be behind the leading edge of the cloud. And if you're very lucky, you've got 50% cloud and 50% gap. Now it's very easy because the lift will coincide with the leading edge of the cloud. So this is the baby bear scenario. All happy with that? Easy. Finding the best location in plan view is sometimes problematic. Most people will sail along looking for it. Now, the best lift will create the tallest cloud in this area, and the one upwind will create the tallest cloud there. So my technique is simply, if I'm over here, point at that tallest cloud, and assuming there's a reasonable wind blowing, the glider will actually track. And if you keep pointing at the tallest cloud, you'll finish up in line with it, and in the strongest bit of lift. If you overshoot, you end up over here, still keep pointing at the tallest cloud, and you'll drift back. Okay. Couldn't be easier, could it, Simon? <laughs> Once you've found it, the conventional way with wave is to sort of saunter along. Now, it could be that the usable bit of lift is quite narrow, and it often is, it's certainly at Cyford. You probably remember from the satellite picture, the waves got shorter as the uh, went downwind. So you may find there's only a narrow piece of lift. And I tend to use this technique anyway. If the wind is less than the minimum speed for the glider, say it's a 20 knot wind and you're flying at 45 knots, then you're going to be moving forward at about 25 knots. And you'll end up flying through some good lift and then the lift will start to fade as you move further out into the gap. All I do is circle. Now, obviously, as you circle the downwind section, you're moving with the wind. So you're covering more ground and then slowing down into wind. So your circles, whoops, back one. Your circles will take you back to through the lift. And by sort of keeping listening to the vario, as it peaks, turn back into wind, and you've managed to stay in the same place laterally. So you're not losing the lift, but and just repeating that. If the wind is reasonably strong, you probably only need one or two turns at most to get back into the lift. That way you know you're in the best lift. It's always easier to drift back into the lift this way than to get too far behind and then go forward. Because obviously you're flying into wind, it takes longer. Remember the lift will be stationary over the ground, roughly speaking. So that's one technique. Particularly in, in light winds, it works well. 
for me. Uh, it's worth trying. You could just do figure of eights in this area. But unless you make each beat exactly the same length, then it may not, you, you may find you're drifting off to the side. And if the wind, as it sometimes is, is an angle to the line of the clouds, that can be slightly confusing. But following the technique of keeping pointing at the tallest cloud upwind, it will keep you in the right place. So you climb up, you get to 5,490 feet, and you need to move out west. So if you think this is the best way of doing it, let's do some arithmetic. If we're soaring here, we're probably going to get something like six to eight down here. Because that's where the sink is behind this cloud. And it's probably going to be about six miles, six or seven miles, typical wavelength. It's going to take you about 12 minutes if you've got a ground speed of 30 and you're flying, at, uh, sorry, speed, wind speed of 30 and you're flying at 60, you're only moving at 30 knots. So it takes you maybe 12 minutes to cover that distance. 12 minutes at six down is a lot. If you're five here, you'll be lucky to be left with 2,000 by the time you get here. And that's almost certainly going to be below the height of the wave. So you're going to face the same problem of getting back into it. If you apply a little bit of uh, thinking, this is the route. Get as high as you can here. Now edge your way along until the lift stops. If there's no lift here, then there's no sink here. So now we can fly forward at our normal sink rate. And as soon as we're being where we think the lift is, edge back across into where the peak of the lift is on this cloud. <clears throat> Happy with that? Good. It's simpler than you say. All right. Um, and the last bit of, of the techniques, this is a scenario, it's not wave actually, but it feels like wave. Sometimes, obviously, if you've got a temperature inversion, normal cumulus will rise, but stop at the inversion. The air here is, ends up being cooler than the air above, so it stops rising. If you've got a real belter of a thermal, then this mass of air will continue to rise through the inversion. Very often, the inversion will also mark a change in the wind strength and direction. So in this case we're showing a strong wind above, light wind below. So this mass of air moving up is obviously moving at the lower speed and takes the time to change. The air moving in this area, which is stable smooth air, will either go round the cloud or above it, have to rise above it. You're actually hill soaring a mobile hill. To get into it, you probably either have to climb up in the cloud, which is usually difficult, or more often you'll find a lift all the way up the front face. But you'll end up well above cloud base in smooth air. Note a caution, for those who are used to wave soaring, this lot is still moving downwind. So it's not static over the ground, it's, it's moving speed. It's quite different, but again, some of the flights I've listed later um, are of this type. It's always worth, if you want to get a little bit higher, just trying up the leading edge of um, any large queue as you get towards the inversion. And just to prove the point, there's a picture of the same thing happening. In this case, the wind is obviously going from right to left, and these clouds are rising and then being picked up by this upper wind, and you get that leaning over look. So if you see that, effect, perhaps not as dramatic as that one. It's, you know, on that day, if you can be thermaling in here, it's always worth seeing what's going on up in this area. Uh, a couple more flights from the logbook. Um, this one's interesting with Phil Schoff. It was his field landing flight. 
what we were doing at 10,000 feet on a field landing flight, well, you can't, you can't say no when you find wave, can you? And we just kept pushing out west and finished up at over 10,000 feet or thereabouts in that area. Uh, another one, thermal then wave at check wind. In that case, the wind recorded was 270, 20 knots. Um, I've got some pictures of the one with Louise. This was a, a winch launch straight into thermal, straight into wave, very similar conditions to the flight you've already seen with Harry Singh. And then a few more. Uh, I don't know if John Reynolds is with us, but that, that was a very interesting flight. Um, we had three climbs. The last was had to be in cloud and then pushing forward into the wave. And it was a really lovely wave slot. Uh, limited only by um, the airway. And of course, one with John some time ago. And that one we had to break off because the slots all closed. Great. Um, these are the ones that Louise took with a mobile phone. There's Stafford, Junction 14, the motorway running around there, Stafford Castle in that area. And you've got an easterly wind and the clouds sort of um, evaporating where the air is descending and warming and then reforming. And that's probably just south of the airfield where we are. Uh, same flight, but again looking north to the northwest. I think that's Chebsey, the, the village just to the north. And again, you can see something of a wave structure. It's not particularly evident, but it's certainly working. And again, looking straight forward. What you can see here is the cloud upwind, and then the air's descending towards us and then rising where we are. And you can see the next wave slot. Um, it would might have been possible to go around the corner like that diagram and then into the, the next slot upwind. Um, sometimes navigation's difficult. It's not here, Newport, um, you've got uh, Telford and the, our old friend the Rekin because we can see it but very often you'll be above cloud. Uh, once uh, Vic Carr sent us from Slate down to Abu Ghaveni and I didn't see the ground for about two hours. This is pre-GPS. You get very nervous at these times. Um, that was an interesting flight because um, the trick of moving away from the lift to move upwind or downwind uh, worked perfectly and didn't hit sink anywhere. Hit, hit a, lot, a lot on the way back and finished up at Shobden, but uh, that's another story. So, threats and errors. Um, you've got cloud and you've got wind. Most times you'll have cloud and wind. Well, if you haven't got wind, you won't have wave. That's, that's certainly true. Um, each of the presents its own challenge, um, but together they can get really interesting. You might need to do a cloud climb or descent. Cloud climbs are optional. Uh, cloud descents sometimes aren't. Okay, so first thing, if you're gonna go above cloud on a day when the gaps are less, you know, uh, fairly narrow, certainly if they're only about a quarter of the sky, you've got to ask yourself, could you bring the glider back down safely? Um, for which ideally you will need um, a horizon. You can do it on a turn and slip, but the clouds, particularly the lower ones, can contain significant turbulence. All right, and that makes cloud flying much more difficult. Okay, um, technique that was mentioned the other week uh, on the BGA webinar was simply pull the brakes, trim the glider for about 50 knots, pull the brakes and leave it to itself. Most gliders will simply enter a uh, stable spiral dive and the speed will probably stabilise around about 70, something like that. Um, it's worth knowing how your glider behaves in those circumstances. So next time you're up high looking to return to the ground, just try it. You know, trim it out, pull the brakes and watch what the glider does. Knowing what it will do in cloud is a useful asset. It's very easy to get lost above clouds, and especially in high winds. So use GPS. I, I was once very high over um, Snowden, 
got a, this is pre GPS got a QDM fix and the wind speed at height was about 90 knots. So I've been flying at 90 just to stay still, turn downwind without too much thinking. Uh, so now my ground speed was 180. I was about 50 miles away. So I thought it would take me 20 minutes. So about 20 minutes later, I called up and got a reciprocal heading and probably reached Newport. Um, it's very, very easy to travel a long way downwind in high winds if you can't see where you're going. GPS would warn you about that straight away. Above all, avoid controlled airspace. It's increasingly important. Uh, you've got a GPS. So again, I don't think I'd go above cloud without GPS nowadays. You've got to get back home. Well, you haven't got to, you can land out. Um, Graham's quite good at that. Um, you may be in comfortable range of the airfield. You might be something like, I don't know, 6,000 feet the other side of, New of Telford. So you look, yeah, it's easy, isn't it? You know, especially downwind. But that line, that straight line, will take you through cloud probably. And uh, that, that can make things difficult. This is where you need to know where the cloud base is going to be. If you know the, where the cloud base is, if it's going to be 2,000 feet, you want to be reaching the airfield or within five miles of the airfield by the time you break cloud base. If you work a rule of thumb, of about a uh, thousand feet will take you five miles but you want a thousand feet left as a, a safety stroke circuit margin then five miles away two thousand feet three thousand feet will give you ten miles range and four thousand feet will give you fifteen miles range and you need to be within those distances from the airfield by the time you get below cloud base that's your critical judgment you probably, if you're local soaring, staying below 8,000 feet or thereabouts, you're limited to eight until you're well the other side of Newport. But if you spend a lot of time up there, you will start to get less efficient. The air pressure is about three quarters that of sea level. Um, and if it's cold, you consume more oxygen anyway. So just be a little bit cautious about you know, the physiology. And lastly, um, keep a good lookout. Uh, sometimes you're mixing it with cloud and it's very important to use cloud discipline, including, I forget the new frequency, making a call on the cloud flying frequencies. Uh, I was popped out of cloud near Chirk and uh, a Nimbus went past about 50 feet below me, running under the cloud. Um, so you, you do need to keep a lookout and say that you, you, sometimes your view is, is restricted. So those are some of the gotchas. Uh, if you know what they are, they're, they're all easy to deal with. You can avoid situations where you're not going to come through cloud in an aircraft that hasn't got the right kit, which includes our twins, actually. Right, um, I'll hold this one. Uh, I'm finishing with um, a flight out of Loweni. Now, I know it's gliding out of sight, but this is particularly interesting for several reasons. It's uh, Matt Wright. Uh, otherwise known as Balika, who is sadly no longer with us, nor his aeroplane. Um, on this particular flight, he talks us through uh, what he's thinking about on the way. And it's not the normal Lueni wave. It's a northeasterly, and it's the primary wave off there. It's also limited by upper cloud. So it's much more the kind of low level stuff that we're likely to get at Cypher. The only difference is, as you've got the fluids forming it, there's a long bar which we don't get but it's an interesting flight he's also brilliant in terms of his use of cameras and editing so um, we'll run that and then uh, uh, i'll deal with any questions that andrew's no doubt collated if there are any
promising signs. Six, seven knots on the average. See the cloud coming down over the uh, Truett Hills, and we hope that this is bouncing up to the waves. So, fingers crossed, we might get a little bit of flying in. <laughs> well, apart from this flying, of course. Oh, this is very promising. I'll skip forward a bit. Nice and smooth. Thank you, Jonathan. Just pause it there. You can see there's an obvious slot in the cloud, and he's just working along the back edge of that slot. along the front edge at 2,000 feet. Oh, I don't know if it's all. You never know. We punch us through this upper stuff. Whiskey Mike 5, uh, one and a half knots then. Yeah, I'm just skipping ahead of it. Point about this bit is you've got the, the the leading edge of the cloud is well forward of the best lift, so they've dropped back and then they're really mixing it with the cloud. A bit further on, they come across the K7, which proves you don't need exotic equipment to go soaring in wave, as long as you're not trying to work your way up wind, that is.
and this is the K7. Nothing about half air brake works about the same. <laughs> Cheeky bastards. Your teeth this morning. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah, gone. Yeah, gone. Just one point, if you look at um, the sky, you'll see that uh, it doesn't look at all wavy, okay, so you don't actually need uh, to know that the wave is uh, that as go on the forecast, don't always look for the signs on the ground. Okay, so wave soaring is fun, it's serene, it's beautiful, it's uh, rarer than thermal, but it's there more than you think it is. So your resolution for this year is to go wave soaring from Cyford. You don't have to go on these expeditions, but we are going to Millfield in September. Okay, any questions? Feel free to uh, unmute yourselves, guys, and ask Peter questions if you want to. Or can I finish the beer? Right. <laughs> Just, just one then, Peter. So, so the only sort of relationship between a place to go and look for and conditions is Chetrand in the northeasterly. If you're looking for specific places, that's quite a reliable place. But you, you know, it can be five miles away. It, it, 
you really just got to look at the signs. If, if, if you're airborne and you can see a patch of sunshine on the ground on a windy day, but that patch of sunshine isn't moving, then go to the downwind side of it. Uh, so and that that's you can't see the slots underneath, but you can see the static patches of sunshine. So that's one th uh, clue. Um, I'm reluctant to say always go to place direction because there are so many variables involved. Well, there does seem to be something in the 270 to 300 degree wind that creates it round about the check wind area. It's probably to do with the wavelength. Okay, thank you. Um, on, on this uh, picture here, you can see the wind socks pretty much all, all the way down. It does, it's not showing any wind. Yep. Uh, so that's just on the ground, presumably higher up. It's, um, it's enough to, to generate wave then. If you've got um, the, that first bounce of wave, if the wind speed doesn't increase with height very much, that, that first bounce can go nearly vertical. Right, you won't get wave down then. They're still running the primary wave, the first one. So you don't necessarily need a high wind speed on the ground to get soluble wave, but you won't get it extending for several wave on snow wind if that's happening. Um, the normal slope inside the wave system has said is something like one in ten. So if you need two knots to soar, you've got to have twenty knots blowing where we are, or you won't be soaring, basically. Um, it, but it's different, you know, it, the variation is uh, if you're close in on the primary wave and there is an increase in wind speed with height. But if those are the conditions, you won't get very high. They were flying around about 2,000 feet, which is very low for Luweni. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Peter, is there, a, is there a wave forecaster on RASP anywhere? There is, yes. I forget where it is. It's in, in the options sections. You can look at the vertical movement. And if you see it lining up in bands, you know, more or less across the wind, it gives you a good idea that wave is there. And I'd have to play with it to find it again. But it, it is. If, if you spend the money on SkySight, their wave forecasts are extremely good. And they are based on the RASP models anyway. Mm, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's right, yeah. Yeah, they are. But you, on RASP, it's actually quite easy to find. You, you just go, you, you set full parameter set and then you go into uh, the, the drop down menu and it will, I think it's at, um, I can't remember, 500 millibars or eight, 850 millibars or whatever. You can see the, the wave on that. That works really well. And, but at, at um, Cypher, I don't know whether Pete, you've done it, but a couple of times I've towed quite high out to the west and had some great well, I had one particularly with Charles Wildblood about two years ago in August. The, yeah. the crap weather had flown through, the warm front had gone through. Um, mm. and we towed up wind and we had probably an hour and a half up way beyond, well, we were probably 30 miles away, but we were at 5,000 feet, a few bumps, and you could really come back. It was an <laughs> exceptional flight, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> I think we lost him. We've gone quiet. I think Peter's frozen, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Come back, Peter. All he's given. It was a great presentation. Everybody keep still so he doesn't feel alone. He'll <laughs> <laughs> uh, come back. He's probably just switching to his phone, like you said. Uh, a, a quick point on, um, I think Peter was talking about the windsock being pointed at the ground. The other thing from there is, is that uh, in strong winds, you can get a rotor. Um, and in this particular case, I suspect from the position that they were soaring, uh, or map soaring, um, it was only just um, by the ridge, which means that that area of uh, calm air is a low wind equivalent of a rotor. Yeah, often, often at Lueni, and I'm sure Chris will 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 agree with this. That the the wind sock down at that end, being in a westerly or an easterly, bears no resemblance to where the wind actually is. It dips down a bit at that end, and you particularly get 
uh, curl over at the end of the airfield in a westerly coming down across the the, the river there but but the Eastley, I saw the Eastley there a couple of times and it, it's fabulous, but it's very low very often, but it, it's fabulous. And, but obviously in the Westerly, it's even better. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, they seem to be soaring a line more or less between where he's parked in that photo and, and the hill. So not very, you know, which is only what, two or three miles um, east of the airfield. Um, I've flown out of Slovenia in situations where you could see the streamlines of the uh, air coming over the hill down into the valley and then back up again and just sat there in a K7 at, in uh, in nothing at 1500 feet for a long time one evening. Lovely. Andrew, I think we've lost Peter completely. Are you still there? Unmute yourself, Andrew. You've, um, you're muted. <clears throat> yeah, guys, I was just saying, I've just shared my screen um, to show the guys in terms of RASP. I was just looking at this the other day. So it's the, um, if you take the overview and click the map view, and then it's the vertical velocity, velocity at 850, which is about 5,000 feet, isn't it? Yeah, so you, that's right. you can just see then there's little bits of the red, and obviously if you zoom in, you can start to see that that's effectively on a good wave day though, Graham, you would see that much more clearly, wouldn't you? Yeah, you would, and I, I agree with Chris. Uh, uh, SkySight is fantastic. I, I use SkySight a lot. I used Top Meteo for quite a long time, but it doesn't give a wave forecast. But it's probably better at thermal than uh, than. Well, it's not better than SkySight. SkySight's really good. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I like SkySight, but I also use RASP quite a lot as well. Fantastic. Well, I think we've lost... We can't say thanks to Peter, because I think we've lost him. I think it's Virgin Media. He's been stressing because he's been having problems with Virgin Media today, so he's been texting me worried about it, and it worked perfectly until right at the end. So I'll... Obviously, pass on everyone's thanks to him. He's done a great talk, and I think we've all learned a lot there, haven't we? I, I, I didn't realise for a second. I, I've obviously been down to Lueni as well, same as Graham, etc. But I didn't realise how much wave we can get at Sideford, and it'll be really good to see if we can uh, can look for that more. It, it's uh, definitely round, Andrew. It's definitely round more than we think because I mean, uh, Phil Donovan. I think he's online as well. Um, myself and him. I can't remember whether it was. This, uh, this year or whether it was um, a bit of last year, we were sodding about in little gaps and ended up um, up for well over 30 minutes, 40 minutes until it all collapsed and had a lovely time. So uh, if Phil's there, perhaps he can tell us about that. That was great. Yeah, that I, was I, just I, I put on top that of that as well. Um, I can see Pauline is on the, uh, uh, from the <laughs> session as well and Pauline and I were in the K13. Uh, probably about five years ago. And I don't we, remember that then. It, we contacted uh, Wave right over the top of the field and we went up to 5-3. I don't um, remember that. But <laughs> <laughs> I've been asleep since then. <laughs> yeah, so if, if you recognise it and can get to it, you know, that, that's it. We had to go take an air or two to get to it. But um, it's uh, it's definitely around Cyford quite a lot. Fantastic. Okay, we can't put any questions to Peter, but uh, next week we have our CFI, the Honourable Paul Witters, giving us a talk on task planning and preparation, which I think given that we're slowly working our way back towards being able to fly will be important when we start thinking about flying cross country and task planning and weather and forecasting and all the things we've got to be thinking about. So that's Paul next Wednesday. Um, and then the Wednesday after, uh, Tiago, who's also on the, on the Zoom, is giving us all a talk from solo to bronze and beyond. So Tiago uh, got his bronze last year. And so he's going to give us all a talk, certainly for people like me, uh, some of the more ab, ab initio pilots in the, in the club, uh, talking us through the, the process 
Um, there's a few of us doing the bronze lectures with Paul Witters at the moment. So that's going to be great for us to, uh, to hear from Tiago about that experience to, you know, from solo and working towards the bronze and the cross country endorsement, etc. So that's Tiago in two weeks time and Paul Witters next Wednesday on task planning and preparation. So thanks, every, thanks very much, everybody. Really good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, I really enjoyed that. Hi. Hi. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Signing off.